Hi, my name is Dr. Allison Reeves and I'm a clinical and forensic psychologist in Toronto. I'm also an assistant professor at the University of Guelph and Guelph Humber in psychology. I'm interested in speaking for a few moments on ethics and in particular a topic related to ethics that we don't typically see in our psychology ethics guidelines. The topic is culturally safe practice. And this is an important topic from my vantage point because I work in anti-oppressive psychology and in particular within indigenous community contexts. So I'm gonna share a little bit today about this, this notion of what is culturally safe practice. It relates largely or was founded largely on working with indigenous clients in Indigenous community contexts in Canada, but I would argue that it's actually relevant to working with all of our clients. This is a model of cultural safety that we developed at Anishinaabe Health Toronto when I was the psychologist there. If you're interested in seeing the article and the research, I've included a link to Anishinaabe Health Toronto's website. This is a model that you can see here has the four quadrants of the medicine wheel. We tend to start with cultural awareness, where first we acknowledge that there's differences here in the room. Cultural sensitivity has been a term that historically we've used to talk about, you know, changing our attitudes and being receptive to differences between ourselves and our clients. Cultural competence is developing some skills, and knowledge about working across cultural barriers. But finally, the last quadrant in white here refers to this term cultural safety. There's a lot of these buzzwords that you'll hear, and there's many more cultural humility, cultural literacy. But what we've landed on here with this concept of cultural safety is that it begins with self reflection. We're less interested in learning about quote unquote the other, and we're more interested in starting with ourselves. How can I reflect on myself and my social location to understand better my own biases and assumptions and even prejudices? That way we can hopefully develop a little bit more empathy and advocacy for our clients. The concept of cultural safety was actually first introduced by Dr. Ramston, a Maori nurse in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, back in the 90s, she's actually since passed away, but she left us this really valuable concept of cultural safety. Cultural safety moves beyond cultural competence and beyond cultural sensitivity. As I said, it begins with self-awareness of the practitioner herself. It also encourages us to analyze power imbalances within society. Within an Indigenous community space, think about self-determination and decolonizing. So regaining rights to decide the communities for themselves, what they'd like and what works for them in terms of health practices in this particular case. And it's also important to respect the epistemology or the worldview of the client with whom we're working. In terms of self-awareness, you're probably well aware of this concept of intersectionality. So the social determinants of mental health and who we are, how are these elements of identity forming, you know, or informing our health outcomes. And so oftentimes in therapy, we'll work with our clients and say, you know, who are you? What is your sort of intersectionality? How do those dimensions of diversity influence you? And so for instance, we'll unpack power and privilege. Here's an image that shows some dimensions of diversity in terms of gender, race, and ethnicity. And it allows us to see how power and privilege works in society and how marginalization can impact health outcomes. Oftentimes I sort of get my students to pause and tell me what's going on here in this image and how does this relate to intersectionality? Of course, this notion of cultural safety starts with self-reflection. So we want to actually think about our own biases, prejudices, and how for many of us, we actually do carry racist thoughts and beliefs, even if we're not aware of that or that we don't intend to be doing that. So we need to be careful around value and position, not sort of uh, 
defining what's right or wrong for a client based on our thoughts and feelings. And of course, that all comes from these hidden um, norms that we've grown up with in our culture. So self-reflection is a way to unpack that. You know, in my own life, I would start by looking at my immediate parents and my ancestors. You know, how, how has my cultural standpoint been shaped by these influences in my life, both from a Western European background as well as Caribbean background in my particular case? So another element of, that's important with cultural safety thing is that we sort of have to think about and unpack power imbalance in our society. Uh, and in this case, we can also unpack power within the field of psychology. Now, a common critique of the field of psychology is that the paradigms are quite Eurocentric in nature. Even though the study of psychology and the current research comes from a whole lot of different areas in the world, including North America, of course, that a lot of these paradigms actually originated in terms of schools of thought from a Eurocentric paradigm. So there is a drawback in psychology that our biases as psychologists tend to be rooted in what we think is normative from a Eurocentric paradigm. Cultural safety has us even unpack those power um, dimensions within even the field of psychology. So, excuse me, for my work with Indigenous community contexts, I might start by understanding the history of residential schools and how colonization and hurtful political policies have influenced generation after generation of Indigenous peoples, and how does this relate to power, privilege, bias, judgment, racism, that I might be unconsciously carrying as a healthcare provider. And by the way, this is not ancient history. We have many Indigenous nations in Canada who are still struggling to stand up for self-determination, to win land rights, and even protecting the environment for all of us. Here's an example of um, someone whose cabin was burnt down by arsonists because he was trying to defend the um, ecology of the region. He didn't want the pipeline to go through his Wet'suwet'en territory in BC. And this is a very recent example from August 2020. So individuals who are still facing colonial attacks directly in, in their efforts to preserve the environment. And of course, this is not just stuck, to, you know, rooted in Canada. This is a global issue for Indigenous peoples all over the world. Here's an image of the rainforest being cut down in Brazil. And this is an image from the Guardian newspaper. And it shows us the stark reality of how Indigenous rights and land rights coincide with, you know, contemporary capitalism and efforts to erode the ecology of the planet. It's a very stark contrast here. So what I'm asking you to do as therapists is to look beyond just what's happening in the room when you consider cultural safety, to think about larger social processes that might be harming communities who have been historically marginalized. Yes, we've had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada who have acknowledged the harmful history that residential schooling has done to Indigenous communities everywhere. And in fact, within the Canadian Psychological Association, we created a task force to also address reconciliation within psychology. Here are some of the elements that we looked at in terms of psychology's ethical code. You'll all be familiar with this. We need to respect the rights and dignity of persons, responsible caring, integrity in relationships, and responsibility to society. And unfortunately, what we found when we looked at reconciliation in psychology is that more often than not, we have failed to uphold our own ethical codes when it comes to interactions with indigenous populations. So for instance, utilizing therapies and assessment tools which are not culturally appropriate, which are biased and pathologizing, which further harm communities, re-traumatize individuals, Re, re, relates to apprehending children. We have not spoken out publicly against harmful colonial policies such as residential schooling and use the platform that we have as psychologists to describe the, the very real traumas that have occurred to these communities 
So in many ways, psychology, within psychology, we have sort of failed our, to uphold our own ethics. And in fact, we made a statement of acknowledgement. We said that we failed to meet our own ethical standards. We said that these failings root back as far as the development of the profession of psychology in Canada. That we uh, apologize for not opposing discriminatory develop, uh, governmental policy. That we've colluded with policies and laws that have oppressed and marginalized peoples. You can take a moment and read this, the lengthy statement of acknowledgement, but this is to say that because through a cultural safety lens, we consider ourselves, we consider our own biases, and we also look at larger systems of injustice, that it's important as helpers, therapists, psychologists, to fully acknowledge how our profession can play a role in either helping folks or actually further hurting folks. Some of the guiding principles that we like to introduce through our um, task force, through the Canadian Psychological Association, is to engage in cultural allyship, humility, collaboration with Indigenous peoples and healers, engaging in critical reflection on how we've potentially contributed harms, um, engaging with true respect for other populations and other ways of knowing that go beyond the Western Eurocentric paradigm, and really engaging in social justice efforts. When I'm working with my students in psychology, I differentiate between these two concepts, epistemological hybridism and epistemological racism. One of the elements of cultural safety, of course, introduced by Dr. Ramston, is to make space for your patient's epistemology or ways of knowing. So it could be that you're working cross-culturally with someone who has a strong propensity to believe in uh, and, and benefit from indigenous healing, connection with spirituality, connection with the land. Those elements may be different from what you've been trained to focus on in psychotherapy. And yet, if you practice from an epistemological hybrid stance, you can make space for multiple ways of knowing and accepting your client's worldview in the room. Alternatively, if you engage in what we call Western elitism, that idea that West is best and that we can only follow Eurocentric paradigms, then you run the risk of engaging in what we call epistemological racism. Some quick examples, this idea of an indigenous uh, epistemology or paradigm that tends to be relatively consistent across the diverse indigenous nations are ideas like that we're all connected. We're connected to the land, we're connected to the animal creatures, we're connected to minerals and to the cosmos, that we're all related and embedded. So making room for that kind of belief system. Respecting traditional medicines, here we have tobacco and cedar and sweetgrass and sage. Respecting that these medicines can be used in a ceremony. Respecting indigenous spiritualities, for instance, that would be another way to ex uh, express this notion of hybrid thinking. To me, engaging in cultural safety ultimately is a journey. It's an ethical journey where we engage in real reflection on ourselves, the colonial wounds that have been done, what are the long-term impacts in terms of trauma, and really having that sensitivity to what may be going on for our Indigenous clients. It's a shift in thinking. You know, way back when, they used to say, oh, that we have an Indian problem. Well, in fact, it's actually a settler problem when we think about epistemological racism. We want to avoid binary thinking. In fact, Western psychotherapies can work quite nicely alongside Indigenous healing. Becoming uncertain and engaging in cultural humility means saying, you know, I don't always have the right answer, but I'm, I'm willing to learn and my, my ears are open and my heart is open. This is what I hope you take forward in terms of your ethical journeys. And lastly, a very prominent Native American scholar who's a psychologist, Joseph Gaughan, says that those who are truly committed to diversity, collaboration, and empowerment of Indigenous peoples will always be respectfully welcomed. 
into various indigenous communities. And I would encourage you to reflect fully on cultural safety. How can I become a culturally safe practitioner? It's my client who will let me know if I've been culturally safe. I don't determine that for myself. And hopefully I can follow Dr. Gon's words and recognize that if I'm really respectful, engaging in a culturally safe practice, then we can all work together towards healing. Thank you.